morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our Monday uh, webinar on defective concrete and repair strategies. Just letting everyone into the uh, into the webinar now. We'll give everyone a minute or so to, to join. As you know, we um, host these daily webinars uh, twice a day now. So the 11 o'clock session and also our one o'clock session. Uh, check on our website for updates on what the uh, topics are throughout the week. Uh, and this is all part of the isolation um, series where we try and offer the opportunity to connect while you might be isolated and stuck at home and, and maybe pick up something new about uh, the civil engineering industry. So just a bit of housekeeping, as you know, you've been let into the meeting room and you're just on mute at the moment. So if you want to ask a question, just take yourself off mute and feel free to interrupt. Otherwise, you can use the chat feature and um, and just type a question in either directly to me or to the entire group. And also to let you know this um, this meeting is being recorded. Uh, so it will be available later today uh, on our website on the webinars page. So it looks like most people are, are in now. So we might um, we might get started if that's all right. As I said, we're talking about uh, effective concrete and repair strategy. A bit of a long one today. Uh, I was contemplating divided up, dividing it up into two presentations, but instead I've gone with a, a slightly more concise version uh, covering two parts of this topic in one go. So let's see how that works out. All right, so what is defective concrete? So it's any concrete which doesn't meet requirements. So this can be at the point of construction due to poor placement techniques, or it can be due to damage that occurs uh, during the life of the structure from chemical attack or fire, for example, uh, or otherwise structurally overloaded elements. It can also be just due to aging and environmental effects. So any concrete that doesn't meet the design requirements or the specification requirements would be considered to be defective concrete. So why do we repair concrete? Again, broken up into three categories, uh, aesthetics for appearance and safety, uh, so we may want the concrete to look better. We also may uh, want to prevent uh, slips and trips or mould growing. So that would be aesthetic reasons. There's also the durability. The durability comes in two parts. You've got the current visible corrosion that you can see on the surface, you know, through spalling and, and concrete starting to fall off and signs of corrosion. But you also have future, cor future corrosion potential that you may want to take care of. So in other words, you know, because the concrete is defective, is it going to increase the susceptibility to corrosion in the future? So do we need to make a repair now to prevent that occurring? Uh, and then finally, uh, to increase structural capacity. And that could be because either it, it's, the structure is not adequate or we're upgrading the structure. So we need to increase its capacity. So repair methods will include removal and replacement of defective concrete, strengthening injection techniques. We've had a whole webinar on that topic previously and then applying coatings and toppings as well. The types of structures that require repair, very common in marine infrastructure, uh, obviously because of that saltwater environment, very aggressive, same with sewer and wastewater, uh, very aggressive environments where concrete uh, really is pushed to its limits. We also see it in bridges, underground structures and buildings, very commonly uh, um, requiring upgrading and repairs. And of course, everything we do relates to civil infrastructure. So we see those types of structures a lot in the type of work that we do. So just running through some of the common defects and what you might see when you're out on site. So honeycombing is a pretty common one. This is where the aggregate and the cement paste aren't evenly distributed. So the aggregate may have fallen out of the, um, out of the mix uh, and it ends up with you know, voids between the large aggregate, as you can see in the photo. And it ends up being porous and weak in that area. And obviously you can have accelerated corrosion as well, simply because uh, contaminants can migrate into that concrete a lot easier. And this occurs due to poor placement techniques. So if the concrete is dropped from a height, the aggregate can fall out faster, over vibration, things like that can um, create honeycombing. Cracking, so as we've seen in previous webinars, concrete is designed to crack, but that cracking must be controlled. Um, cracking can occur due to structural overload, drying, shrinkage, thermal effects, or even poor placement. Again, we've covered these topics, so I'm not gonna go into this in a lot of detail today. Cold joints, as you can see in the photo there, non-continuous concrete placement. So where we place 
a, say a truck load of concrete and there's a delay between applying the next load of concrete. And what can happen is you have discontinuity in your structural elements and that results in a weakened structure or greater exposure to corrosion. So you can see there a little bit of honeycombing forming on around that coal joint and you can see that the concrete is going to be more porous in that area and you've got discontinuity uh, in the structure so that will re require repair. Spalling, this occurs when pieces break away from the concrete, uh, typically seen in concrete cancer, as you can see in the photo there, but it can also be a result of uh, fire in the um, structure as well, where you have expansive pressures, which push away that surface of concrete. And you can see there in those little illustrations, how the corroding reinforcing bar expands as the iron oxide is formed and that expansion creates pressure internally and eventually leading to spalling, creating that concrete cancer. And by then it's, it's usually too late to try and prevent um, the corrosion occurring. We're now dealing with a whole new problem because it wasn't addressed early enough. Steel corrosion, which is part of that process, uh, can occur because the concrete isn't providing enough protection to the steel. So concrete and steel are great friends. You know, they work together in unison. One's good in compression, the other one's good in tension. And concrete provides a nice alkaline environment to passivate corrosion in the steel. But when concrete isn't doing its bit to protect the steel, uh, then that's when corrosion starts occurring. And this can happen because of cracks occurring in the concrete, inadequate cover. So if your steel reinforcement is too close to the surface, uh, whether you've got carbonation and that carbonation attacks the concrete and reduces the alkalinity, uh, porosity in your concrete, or even just the presence of chlorides and other contaminants. So in a marine structure, those chlorides from the seawater will migrate and attack the steel and create corrosion. We can also have rain damage. So where the slab or um, element is placed and while it's still in the plastic stage, if rain falls, it can wash out the cement paste from the surface, create that weakened layer, and then the surface ends up chalky, soft, and rough, and that will require repair as well. And just one of the last ones I'll touch on is, is fire damage. Obviously, there's a lot of um, ways concrete can um, be damaged, but just covering the main topics here. Fire damage causes micro concrete cracking and um, spalling. Uh, it can reduce the compressive strength, it reduces the modulus of elasticity, so it makes it um, more elastic and softer. You can lose the bond between the concrete and the steel reinforcement because of that heat. And you can also lose and, and do lose the pre-stress in pre-stressing tendons. So that will change the way the structure reacts to, um, to loading. So it can be quite um, detrimental to the structure having a fire, as you can see in the photo there, and that can require quite extensive repair or rebuild. So material structural properties. Uh, there's, there's two components to picking a, a material for repair. There's the mechanical properties and there's the corrosion protection properties. I feel that the corrosion protection properties obviously get a lot of focus, but not so often do we get a lot of focus on the mechanical properties. And when we do, it tends to be the wrong items that get focused on. So I just want to talk a little bit about that. So really importantly, when you're repairing a structure, the structure after it's repaired needs to respond to loading as per the design. So the mechanical properties of the repair mortar are crucial here. So as it's loaded up, it has to deform and spread the load in the same way that it would have when it was originally designed because unloading, uneven loading and stress concentrations could occur if the material properties aren't compatible with the host structure. I'll just go into that in a little bit more detail. So when we're talking about the various properties that we look at for mechanical, um, so compressive strength is the first one that most people turn to. So what is the compressive strength of the repair mortar and how does that relate to the original structure? So when we talk about compressive strength, that's just the failure point. So you can just see my little arrow there pointing to the failure point. This is a stress strain diagram for a material. So as the material is put under compression, it'll strain, so it'll deform, and it'll deform evenly as that stress is applied. And eventually it hits a point, which we call a yield point, and it starts to yield, and then eventually you've got failure. So compressive strength is just the maximum stress capacity that the material will take. So it's not how the material will respond to the actual load, it's only the failure point. And it's only important that that failure point 
is a minimum amount. So it has to be at least as strong as the original concrete that it's replacing. On the other hand, modulus is the deformation relative to the load. So that's how much the, um, the repair mortar is deforming in accordance with the load that's applied to it. So this is actually the most important property. It's actually the slope of the stress strain um, curve. And you require the repair to deform at the same rate under load as the original concrete would have. And just to illustrate that, when you um, bend a beam, so your grey box there is a beam and it starts to bend. You can see it bends evenly and it bends all the way along the length of that beam and we don't have load concentration. So this is the original structure under bending. When, on the other hand, we use a low modulus repair mortar, so we use a very elastic repair mortar. So say we use an epoxy or a low modulus grout and we put that same structure under bending. What happens is that we end up with stress concentration. So what's happening there is the flexible repair mortar isn't taking any load and the bending is all occurring through that narrower section. So you end up with more compression in the bottom of that repair area and you end up with tension over the top. So you end up with higher bending forces. This can become particularly problematic in columns because you end up with eccentricities, which means that you're introducing bending into a column that would have been under compression previously. So we're getting very uh, engineering focused here on this one. When you end up with a higher modulus repair, so you, you put a very stiff repair mortar in, the mortar itself will end up taking more load than what otherwise you would have seen. And because of that, you end up with stress concentrations adjacent to that repair, and you end up with very high tensile behaviour across the top of the repair mortar. And in columns, again, that can cause eccentricities, which cause problems, extra tensile forces in the host structure, which can cause damage. So really important to match that modulus when you're talking about um, a repair mortar. More important than matching the actual compressive strength. Other properties we look for in terms of um, the durability of, of the repair. Chloride diffusion uh, is an important one. So you want a repair mortar that's gonna resist the ability for chlorides to migrate. Uh, that's so that you don't get a chloride, chloride attack on the steel reinforcement. There's a couple of ways of measuring chloride diffusion. One is an estimate only, and that's the rapid chloride diffusion test. So we estimate how fast chloride ions can diffuse by doing another electrical test. And that's uh, just through correlation. We're estimating how fast they're going to diffuse. The more accurate way to measure, and it takes more time to do this test, but it's worthwhile doing, where is where, as you can see in the diagram then, we actually put a sample into a sodium chloride solution and we leave it there and we actually expose it to that solution for a certain amount of time. We take it out under the Nord test and we actually measure how far those chloride ions have migrated through into the sample and then we can extrapolate what that means over the lifetime of the structure. So this gives us a real um, accurate and measured solution for, for chloride diffusion and it's a better way to go. Electrical resistivity is another property in a repair mortar that you would look for. So it measures the conductivity of the repair mortar and this is really important for cathodic protection. So this requires a current to be passed through the concrete so that that cathodic protection can work well. Just one point on that is that um, the measurement at seven days will be very different to the measurement at after 28 days of cure, be different again to 56 days of cure. Always better to have uh, the data on at least 56 days of cure to give you an accurate um, representation of what the electrical resistivity will be for the product. Uh, shrinkage is another property that's important. Obviously, you want volumetric stability to reduce cracks forming once you've made the repair. Um, shrinkage testing isn't always representative though. So expansion systems within a repair mortar can sometimes disguise the volumetric stability. Uh, in other words, if, if we're measuring the shrinkage at 28 days, it's not really telling us what's happening up until that point. So are we having expansion in the first few hours, which then compensates for the shrinkage that occurs later? If you had a grout or a mortar that reacted like that, then what would happen is you would have expansion in your repair mortar, which wouldn't be in the direction that you needed it. So that expansion wouldn't be useful to you. Then when the shrinkage kicks in after one or two days and then is ongoing for the next 56 days, that entire section will shrink back and cause cracking. 
So it's important to make sure that the type of testing we're doing is representative of the actual uh, application that we're um, using the mortar in. And I'll talk more about that on Wednesday when we talk about volumetric stability of, um, of grouts and mortars and the type of testing that's available. So just talking about the repairs themselves now. So concrete preparation, it's really important just to note here to remove all the damaged concrete. And it's not always visible um, immediately which concrete has is, is failing to perform and not protect the steel reinforcement. And, and testing is often required for that. So if it has lost alkalinity or if there are chlorides that have migrated into the concrete, you're not gonna see that just by looking at the concrete. There are tests that are needed um, to be done. So just make a comment that if steel reinforcement is corroding, rather than looking at the steel and saying, what's wrong with the steel, we should always be saying, what's wrong with the concrete? And why isn't it protecting that steel? Then in removing that concrete, there are a few methods available. We can use a pneumatic hammer or a jackhammer to, to break it away. We can use high, ultra high pressure water blasting, as you can see in the photo, you know, 30,000 PSI of water pressure to blast away that concrete. We can saw cut it out. We can shot blast or scarify a surface and we can also grind a surface to remove defective concrete. Surface profile is one of the things we look for uh, once we've done the preparation. So surface profile is the roughness, if you like, of the surface. And the larger the profile, the greater the key we're getting between the repair material we're applying and the host surface. And you can see there that the ACI guidelines, which I've just uh, copied in, actually provide different gradings for the different levels of surface roughness. And you'll often see that referred to in our own um, technical data sheets and repair methodology, uh, the type of uh, surface roughness we require for that material because different materials will require diff different levels of roughness. So for an example, an epoxy coating may require a CSP1 or a CSP2, whereas a concrete patch repair may require CSP5 to give us that better key into the surface. Replacement of reinforcement, there are guidelines on this. Typically, we have more than 20% of the diameter lost in the reinforcing bar. It needs to be replaced. We also need to replace bars or move bars where the cover is inadequate. So we need to move those back into a spot where the cover will be adequate. We need to cut those out and replace them. There are guidelines for lap length that need to be referred to. And we need to remove the concrete at least 20 millimetres behind that bar so that that bar is encapsulated with consistent concrete all the way along its length and it's fully enclosed and protected from corrosion later down the track. We need to clean remaining reinforcement that hasn't been replaced. And we need to make sure we break back that concrete all the way along to expose all of the areas of reinforcement that have been affected and wherever the concrete isn't protecting that steel anymore. Concrete priming. Um, concrete priming is important. It prevents moisture loss uh, when, when, you are, when you're putting your, your repair mortar on. So it ensures that in the contact zone, we don't have moisture being drawn out of that repair mortar because if moisture gets drawn out of the repair mortar, you might not have necessary water in there to uh, create full hydration and curing and strength development of the repair mortar and then it can result in a, a lower strength bond uh, to the surface. So priming improves the connection to the host surface. The primer needs to be vapor permeable. So we don't use epoxies. Uh, there was a period probably back in the 80s and 90s where epoxies were proven to give really high bond to a surface. But we now know that the epoxy uh, doesn't allow vapor transmission. So while it may, it may give really good sh short term results in terms of bond, it's not great in terms of long term performance, particularly in a marine or sewer environment where you have that vapor um, transmission requirement. So now we use acrylics or even plain water saturation is good enough. Whatever it is, it just has to be low enough viscosity to provide the highest amount of permeation back into the structure, providing that um, really strong key to the host structure. Steel priming is another uh, topic. We don't recommend steel priming at all uh, with any of our repair mortars. You can see a cross next to that photo uh, in the diagram there. And it's pretty obvious why when you look at that, why you wouldn't want to prime uh, the steel and then why you wouldn't want to have such a heavy primer also on your concrete. You're actually isolating the repair by doing that. The repair mortar you use usually is 
very high performance uh, alkaline and it's designed to protect your steel. If you go and isolate your steel bar by applying a coating or another primer, then you're isolating and you're stopping that repair mortar from doing its job. On top of that, you can add to the incipient corrosion effects. So what that means is that it can accelerate corrosion adjacent to that repair by applying things like a zinc coating. So we really do want to avoid applying any coatings at all to our steel reinforcement. We just want it clean and we want it coated well with our repair mortars. Cathodic protection, uh, that's another topic altogether. It's, it's a very specialised science. There are effectively two types. There's effect active and passive um, cathodic protection. Active just means you're passing a voltage through the steel reinforcement to prevent corrosion. Passive means that you're fixing an, a type of metal anode, as you can see in the photo, um, to passivate um, corrosion. And both work well, and there are specialists in that area that can provide advice and design on that. So looking at repair mortar application, a few different types. And again, we'll go into more detail on this in the next few days. There are upcoming presentations about dry spraying. But dry spraying is one method of applying our repair mortar. The powder is actually pumped dry to the point of the nozzle. And you can see in the photo there, the nozzle that the applicator is, is holding. And that at that point is where it's mixed with water. So you can see just on that nozzle, there's a little water inlet and there's air that, that comes in as well and that applies and mixes right at the nozzle and gets applied. So what it means is you, you're moving the powder dry, which means that um, you can mix it at the nozzle with less water than you would typically need. And it means that you end up with a lower water cement ratio with dry spray and you end up with better compaction on the surface as well. It's also really suitable for large volume applications because you can apply a lot of product very quickly because the powder is just being pumped through the system mixed with water at the nozzle and applied in pretty decent volumes per hour. Wet spray, on the other hand, it's pre-mixed with water, then it has to be pumped along the hoses and then it's sprayed onto the surface. So you need a little bit more water to make the mortar pumpable uh, and you end up with a slightly lower dense um, density on your final product and probably not as compact and impermeable and resistant to, to corrosion in the future. So um, dry spray provides a better outcome, wet spray, a little bit higher water content. Then we also have hand troweling as another way of applying. It's a pretty slow process. Obviously you're mixing it in small batches and troweling it into the surface. So these are good for small repairs. Self-leveling uh, is another type of repair uh, applied to floor surfaces. You can see there very fluid grouts which will level themselves, can be applied across a surface and can repair surfaces which have been damaged from uh, rain during casting, chemical attack or poor finishing. And these could be either in a cementitious format, an epoxy format or a range of other materials or resin materials that are available for self-leveling. Different curing methods uh, should be applied after the, the repair for cementitious repairs. So adding a curing compound uh, will provide a higher quality surface. You'll be maintaining moisture at the surface, which minimizes plastic cracking. We can use water-based wax emulsions or acrylics uh, over the surface. And they should be applied as soon as possible after finishing of the concrete. And that'll just stop that moisture evaporating out of the surface and any micro cracking occurring. Structural strengthening is another form of repair. Uh, this increases the load capacity with reinforcement, which is applied typically to the surface. Uh, it's usually externally applied to beams, columns and slabs. We can use carbon fibre, as you can see in the photo, or steel plates. And these can either be mechanically or adhesive fixed. So carbon fibre um, is usually adhesive fixed via an epoxy and will strengthen that slab. Uh, typically, they're um, surface fixed. Um, structural strengthening is only utilised for to improve the structure's um, ability to resist deformation rather than actually strengthening the structure under load. And that's because the strengthening is exposed to fire. Uh, so in the case of a fire, if that strengthening did break down, then obviously it wouldn't be able to support the structure. So usually we're only using it for, um, for live loads and deformation. 
Surface coatings, uh, these can be applied after concrete is placed for the purpose of chemical protection, slip resistance and safety, or aesthetics for signage and, and line marking. Surface preparation is critical for this type of application, uh, and it usually is applied 28 days after curing of the concrete, particularly for a resin-based uh, coating. So just in summary, uh, you know, there's a range of repair mortars which can be adopted for, for repairing concrete. Um, materials available include mortars, resins, uh, injection chemicals and grouts. Uh, engineering advice should be sought for, for structural repairs in particular. And understanding both the corrosion and structural issues is really important when repairing concrete. Um, both um, should be factored in when selecting your materials and your methods for the repair. So that's it for our presentation on, um, on concrete repair. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, hopefully we'll see you this afternoon or tomorrow. Thank you.